Just want to welcome you to church. If it's your first time, if you are watching online, you are very, very welcome to be with us. Just before we start, I want to just tell you a story that I heard um, this week about a woman who was in a, in a car park outside the supermarket, and she'd, she'd locked her keys in the car. Um, and she was, she was trying to get her keys out. She was trying the handles. And, and she tried loads of people and said, can you please help me get my keys out of the car? But no one seemed to know what to do. And then eventually she saw one guy. Now, this guy was about six foot four, leathers, tattoos, riding a motorbike. And she said, will you please help me get into my car? So he looked at her and thought, okay, okay, okay. He was in the car in 20 seconds. <laughs> and she gave him a big hug. And she said, thank you, Lord, for sending this nice man to help me get into my car. And she kind of pushed, he kind of pushed her off and said, you just need to know I'm not a nice man. I've probably stolen a thousand cars in my lifetime. She hugged him even tighter and said, thank you, Lord, you sent a professional. just want to welcome you into uh, part three of our message series. We called it Resurrection Stories, where we're continuing that story, uh, where we look beyond the tomb, beyond the, the, uh, the resurrection of Jesus, and continue that narrative into, okay, what happened next? What happened after Jesus was resurrected? And we've been looking at the, the, the story of the early church. It's going to take us right up to, to Pentecost Sunday. So I'd love you to turn with me to John uh, chapter 21 today and we're going to start um, just looking at a part we're going to do this in two messages so I'm going to do part one of this passage Hannah Cadman's going to do part two next week but in the narrative of Jesus Jesus has risen from the dead he's appeared to the women uh, outside the tomb he's appeared on the road to Emmaus he's then appeared to the disciples and then eight days later he appears to Thomas and now we're a couple of days on maybe even a, a week or two we don't really know but we get to this passage and verse one says this later Jesus appeared again to the disciples beside the Sea of Galilee this is how it happened several of the disciples were there Simon Peter Thomas uh, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee the sons of Zebedee as James and John sons of Zebedee are, are James and John and two other disciples we don't know who they were they're not named Simon Peter said I'm going fishing so we have these seven disciples and, and John adds this story in at the end of his gospel kind of as, as an extra little little bit and the disciples have made their way to Galilee and, and, and it looks like they're just kind of waiting around they're just in Galilee and, and but the, the question is why are they in Galilee and not in Jerusalem and we find out in another gospel, Mark, in Mark's gospel, we, Jesus says to the disciples, after I'm raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you to Galilee, and I'll meet you there. And then Resurrection Sunday, the women get to the tomb, they see the stones being rolled away, they go inside, and Mark's gospel says this, they entered the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a white robe sitting on the right side, the women were shocked, but the angel said, don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He isn't here. He's risen from the dead. Now go and tell his disciples, including Peter, that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. You'll see him there, just as he told you before he died. So Jesus has told the disciples to go to Galilee. He said, I'll meet you there. Now these Peter, the disciples, they've seen the resurrected Jesus. They've met with him. They've, they've spoken with him. They've actually physically, maybe if we go that way of the Thomas story, they've physically touched the resurrected Jesus. Now all they have to do is go to Galilee and wait. So they get to Galilee. And they wait. And they wait. And they wait a bit more. And so we have to assume nothing's happening. These disciples, they're in Galilee, they're waiting for Jesus, and, and, they're, and they're not there. And some of the disciples, when we get to this now, some of the disciples aren't even there. Perhaps they've gone off uh, into the town to find food. Maybe it's quite probable, looking at the way, as this text goes on, it's early evening. Maybe some of them actually have just gone to bed. And Peter says this, I'm going fishing. And, and I want to be careful here, because a lot of people criticize Peter for going fishing. They say, oh, he shouldn't be fishing. Uh, he's gone back to his old ways. And I want you to, to remember this. It was at this very spot that Jesus first called Peter. It was on the Sea of Galilee when Jesus called Peter. Luke 4 says this. You can read the whole passage later, but here's the highlights. One day, Jesus was preaching on the Sea of Galilee. 
Great crowds pressed in him to listen to the word of God. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, that's, that's Peter, to push it out into the waters. who sat from there and taught the crowds. When he finished speaking, he said to Simon, Peter, now go out where it's deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. And you can read the rest of the text where it says about Peter has this miraculous catch. And Jesus says, okay, follow me. So Peter is back where it all started. He's back on the Sea of Galilee, back at the place he had his calling, back at the place where he met Jesus, back at the place where Jesus said, listen, you won't be fishing for men anymore. Now you're going to fish for people. This is the place where he left his nets behind. And here's Peter probably feeling, I'm back where I started. I want to pause on that thought. How many of us have gone through faith and thought, do you know what, I'm back where I started. Where we've had moments said, what, what were the last two, three, four years all about? I'm just back where I started. But here's Peter, because I think he gets a bad press. Because loads of people say, if you Google this passage, you'll find pages and pages and pages of people going, oh, Peter, he's gone back to his old ways Jesus has gone, Peter's just kind of left Jesus alone and, you know, and that's just like us, that if Jesus isn't there, we just wander back into our old ways and, and, and that's true because if we don't constantly and intentionally stay close to Jesus, then, then we will fall away. There's no doubt about it, but I don't think that's what's going on here because Peter is here. He's in Galilee. He's not, he's not backsliding or anything like that. He's there because Jesus told him to be. Jesus is in Galilee because Jesus... Uh, Peter's in Galilee because Jesus told him to be. And I don't know how long it took. It could have been days, it could have been weeks, but here's Peter following Jesus' instructions. And maybe Peter couldn't sleep. Maybe Jesus needed to pass the time. And Peter goes fishing. And it is what he's done before. There's no getting away from that. It was what he succeeded in. He had, he had a successful fishing business. We know that because he had more than one boat. And he goes back to what he was doing before Jesus came along. And I wonder if Peter went back to doing what he'd done before solely because he failed at the thing he'd been doing for the last three years. Or he felt he did. And I want to ask this question, you know, what happens when we feel like we've failed? What happens when we experience trauma or we experience loss or we experience grief or, or, or when we feel threatened or when we feel intimidated? Where do we go for comfort? Where do we go for that place that we just know? Can I suggest some of us find comfort in bed? Some of us find comfort in, 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 actually, some of us go the other way. They find comfort in working more. Do you know where I'm stressed? I work more. That's, that's, that's my, my natural inclination. Is this, if, if, if I'm not happy about something, I'll busy myself and I'll, I'll work more. Some of us find comfort in going to the gym. Some of us find comfort in, in friends or in TV or, or they find comfort in, in playing music. Some people find comfort in a bottle. Some people find comfort in the medicine cabinet. Some people find comfort in unhealthy relationships. Some people find comfort online. But Peter finds comfort in the familiar. Or maybe, just maybe, Peter found comfort in his faith. Because Jesus told him to be there. And he didn't know what, he was, what, he was, what was going on. He wasn't giving up. I don't think he was giving up because of his failure. I think he was carrying on because of his faith. Because he wasn't going back to his old life. He was stepping forward into what Jesus had for him. Because he was where Jesus wants to be. He'd gone back to the place where he experienced Jesus and said, I don't know what's next, but I'm going to be where Jesus wants me to be, and I'm going to wait. And while I'll wait, I'll catch some fish while I'm here. And I think sometimes we twist that and think, Peter's just gone to catch some fish. I think Peter's gone, do you know what? I'm going to wait for Jesus, but while I'm here, I'll get some fish. So Jesus is where... Uh, Peter is where Jesus wants him to be. And I want to ask you, you know, when you're in a place where you don't know what's next, how many times have you said, okay, am I where Jesus needs me to be? Am I where Jesus wants me to be? Am I in the right place to meet Jesus? In my heart, in my actions, in my, in my words, am I in the right place for Jesus to speak to me? And I, I think Jesus can speak to anyone in any situation at any time. But you know what? It makes your life easier when you make sure you're where Jesus wants you to be. So Peter's in Galilee, he's where Jesus told him uh, where he wants him to be and it's taken a while, he goes fishing and you go fishing at night. 
and you go fishing at night because the fish are easier to catch in the night. So this whole idea of fishing in the daytime to, to, to Palestinian fishermen in the first century was an absolute, like, why would you do that? You fish at night because the fish are easier to catch. You would have a torch that you would shine in your boat, the fish would rise to the surface and you'd scoop them up with your net. And so off they go, they, they go out into the boat but they caught nothing all night. What happens when something you know works suddenly doesn't work? Can you imagine how bar embarrassing this must have been for Peter? That the, what he does, this is what he does, this is what Peter is trained at, this is what Peter is proficient at, this is what he's good at, and he's an hour in, and you might say, oh, do you know what, it's just a quiet night. Two hours in, this is getting a bit awkward. Three hours in, four hours in, five hours in, he's got the other disciples looking at him going, you're supposed to be good at this. How do you feel? How do you feel when that happens and he pulls in nothing? Now, fishermen catch fish. That's what they do to survive, to, to, to support themselves. Fishermen catch fish. They didn't catch any fish. So they, they find themselves in an impossible situation. No fish means no money. No fish means no food, no income because there's no fish. Nothing to eat because there is no fish. You know, we've, we've got a saying, you know, as, as Christians, we say God opens doors. Do you know what? I think God closes them as well. But I think God closes doors because he wants us to realize which doors are open because I think in, in, this, in this passage, God is closing a door that says, Peter, you can't go back to that old life. You can worry, you can fret, you can stress, but you're not going back to that. And there's a calling on Peter's life that says, do you know what? Your old life's already over. There's more for you outside of the boat, but he needed God to get him out of it. It goes on, at dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who he was. And I love this translation, because the New Living Translation turns Jesus into the perfect English gentleman. He calls out, fellows, fellows, have you caught any fish? I don't know why they do that. But they don't realize it's Jesus, because Jesus is about 100 yards away, and I wear contact lenses, and I, to be honest, if someone was 100 yards away, I'd struggle to work out who it is, particularly as the sun is starting to rise. So they shout back, no, no, we haven't caught anything. So Jesus says, throw your net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you'll get some. So they did, and they couldn't haul in the net, because there were so many fish in it. Now, Jesus is deliberately reminding Peter of something here. Because if you go back to that passage in Luke 4, this was how Peter met Jesus. It's on the same sea, and it's the same miracle. And it's, almost Jesus, it's almost like Jesus hits the reset button and says, okay, Peter, let's start again. Guess what? Things have changed, but I haven't. I can do the same thing in your life now that I did then. You've come to Galilee, you've come this far, and I'm going to remind you of who I am. I'm going to remind you of my power, I'm going to remind you of who you are, and remind you of your calling. And sometimes there'll be times when Jesus will take you back to the place where you first experienced him. So that he can show you something new. That might be through a word. That might be through a song. That might be through something prophetic. But if you put yourself in the right place to hear from God, God will do something in your life to remind you of that moment he first called you. To that moment where he reminds you of who you are called to be. And I, I find this hilarious. I think, I think there's a lot of humor in the Bible because Peter still misses it. He's in Galilee. He's been in Galilee before. He hasn't caught any fish. He didn't catch any fish the last time. Someone tells him what to do. Someone told him what to do last time. He throws his net in and gets a massive catch. The same thing happened last time. Now surely his brain is going, hang on. nothing. He totally misses it. It's actually John who recognizes Jesus. And again, I love the way the Bible does this. The disciple Jesus loved. I love the way John describes himself. I'm the disciple Jesus loved. And he says to Peter, it's the Lord. Can I tell you, we need people in our lives to point us to Jesus. At whatever step in our faith we are at, we need people in our lives to point us to Jesus. And if you know Jesus and you can recognize him working, there's a times you need to be a John in other people's lives. When you can say, this is God. When there's things going on in their lives that they can't explain and you can come along inside them and say, do you know what, there's Jesus. 
That's our role in this community. That we come alongside the hurting, we come alongside the lost, the last and the least, and we say, do you know what, there's Jesus. In their lowest moments, we get into their boat and we say, there's Jesus. It's why we shape everything we do as a church that it points people to Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, we'll point you to him. We call that having your heart revived. If you're struggling with an issue in your life or, or habitual sin or something that's gone in your past, guess what? We'll point you to Jesus. And he'll set you free. We call that having your hope restored. If you don't feel like your life has any direction, if you don't know where your life is going, we'll point you to Jesus who says, follow me, and I'll make you something. We call that having your life rebuilt. Whatever you need this morning, whatever you're looking for, whatever you're struggling with, it's our job as a church to point you to Jesus. And he'll do the rest. So John points to Peter and it says this, and I love this. Simon Peter heard, the, heard it was the Lord. So he picked up his tunic, he grabs his coat, he puts it on. Sorry, sound people. And he jumps in the water. Peter puts on his clothes and then jumps out of the boat. Because I don't know about you, but if I'm on a boat on a lake and someone says, come and jump in the water, I am getting everything off, I'm getting ready to go. I'll stop it. <laughs> I'm not putting my clothes on, I'm taking them off. But Peter does the opposite. He grabs his coat. He puts it on. Slowly. And he jumps in the water. Do you know why he does that? Have you ever been in a, in a fire where a fire alarm's gone off? What do they say to you? Grab your coat and get out. If you're on an airplane and the airplane has to do an emergency landing, they say, grab your coat and get out. Why? Because you're not going back. This will dry. But I'm not going back. I'm leaving that boat. I'm, I'm, geez, Peter hasn't even got the intention of going back to that boat to even get his coat. He takes his coat with him, swims to shore, and as far as we know, Peter never goes swimming, never goes fishing again. He leaves it behind. He grabs his coat. These clothes, they'll dry. But I'm not going to miss Jesus. I'm going to leave everything else behind so I can get to Jesus. Now, now Peter swims 90 meters with a coat on. I want to think about that. Swimming 90 meters is one thing. Swimming 90 meters with a coat on. And he swims 90 meters with his coat on just to get to shore. He leaves everything else behind so he can follow Jesus says this, the others stayed with the boat and they, they pulled the net to the shore. And when they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them. Fish cooking over a charcoal fire and some bread. So Peter swims to Jesus. He leaves everything else in the boat. He leaves the massive catch of fish that he hadn't got all night. He leaves it on the boat, gets to shore. What's there waiting for him? Fish. A charcoal fire with fish. And I love that. Jesus comes along, invites him for breakfast. What's on the menu? The fish that you couldn't catch. What they spent all night fishing for, what they spent all night searching for, what they spent all night working for, Jesus had fish waiting. And when we read this text, I want to encourage you, whatever you're working for, whatever you're believing for, whatever you're waiting for, God's got it covered. And we can spend our time working and stressing and, and straining and reaching something, but when we look up and we follow the voice on the shore, we realize God's got it covered. I don't invite the band back up, and I want you to notice this, this last thing. The fish is cooking, Jesus is cooking this fish, but he's cooking it on a charcoal fire, and you're thinking, what does that matter? Well, he's by the Sea of Galilee. You can't get charcoal on the Sea of Galilee. You can't get it. It's a sea. 
So why does John mention a charcoal fire? You know, what? I mean, it's not going to be a gas fire, obviously, but, but, but why is John specifically saying he's cooking on a charcoal fire? And it's interesting because there's only one other time in the entire Bible a charcoal fire is mentioned. John 18 says this, the trial of Jesus. Peter walks into the high priest's house and he warms himself by a charcoal fire says this in John 18, because it was cold, the household servants and the guard had made a charcoal fire. They stood around it warming themselves. Peter stood with them warming himself. As he was standing by the fire, they asked him again, you're not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it, saying, no, I'm not. This charcoal fire, he denies he even knows Jesus. And here he is again at another one. And you might think, well, so what? It's, 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 it's just a fire. But you can't get charcoal around the Sea of Galilee. If you're going to make a fire around the Sea of Galilee, you, you use, use driftwood. Because that, that's all available. Now, I don't know where Jesus got the charcoal from. But he does it deliberately. Jesus is doing something intentionally there that he, he brings the charcoal. He does it on purpose because charcoal smells different. I don't know if you know this. Charcoal smells different to other, other things you burn. And smells evoke memories. Who's walked into a place, smelt something, suddenly you're, you're 20 years earlier in your life? You've walked into a room and there's a smell that's hit you and suddenly there's a memory that you thought was long lost. And suddenly it comes back because of a smell. Suddenly here's pizza, the smell of charcoal. And in a moment he remembers. This was where I denied Jesus. And here's Jesus, the man Peter denied, cooking fish on a charcoal fire, and Jesus offers that fish to Peter. I think Peter finds his restoration in that moment. And in this act, I think Jesus is, is replacing that memory of denial. And Peter must be thinking, the last time I was, I was around this type of fire, I, I, I denied, I even knew you. And Jesus hands in some fish as, as a symbolic act and says, okay, that was then, this is now, let's eat. And I think for some of us, Jesus is saying, you know, the, the same thing. He's saying that our relationship is more important than your failure. Our relationship is more important than your past. Our relationship is more important than your guilt or regret. And in that moment, Peter's relationship with Jesus is restored. He's forgiven. What could have been that charcoal, every time he saw charcoal, could have been a constant reminder of his failure. Actually, it's a symbol of his forgiveness. Peter becomes the leader of the early church. But it starts from this place of restoration. You know, for us, one of the, the biggest lies you can tell yourselves is you, you could do something that can remove you from the love of God. Peter denying Jesus three times was, was one of the worst things you could do, but Jesus still says, come on, let's, let's eat. You don't have to bring anything, I've, I've brought it. And for all of us, God's ready to forgive you. God's ready to restore you. God's ready to speak life into you. Whatever it is you're worried about, God will give you a confidence and a hope that in all things, God's got it covered. And we always want to offer that invitation, come and eat. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what type of person you, you think you are. It doesn't matter if you feel like you've got nothing to bring. Jesus would say, my relationship with you is more important. It was so important, he died for you. And Jesus says, come and, come and eat. Come and have your relationship restored. Come and have your heart revived and let me take you on a journey. If you feel like you're lost or you feel like you're not good enough, the Bible says this, everyone sinned. There's no getting away from that. We've all fallen short of God's glorious standard, yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins, for God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. It says in that same passage this, God has shown us a way to be made right with I want to suggest for all of us, this is a charcoal fire moment. That he's shown us a way, he, he, he's pointing us to Jesus and, and all we've got to do is get out of the boat. 
But Jesus wants to restore you wherever you are in your, your relationship, in your life. Jesus wants to restore you. He wants to revive your heart. He wants to bring you back into a relationship with him. And I want to encourage you, jump out of the boat. Leave behind the boat of your life. Leave behind your doubts. Leave behind your failures. Leave behind your uncertainties. Put on your coat and swim to Jesus. We just bow our heads. And we want to give you that invitation. There's two invitations here. That if you're already a follower of Jesus, but there's, there's circumstances that have meant actually you've jumped back into your own boat. Would you make a decision this morning to jump out of your boat and allow Jesus to restore you? Maybe you've never made a decision to follow Jesus. Maybe you're sat here this morning or you're, you're watching online and, and you've had that sense of Jesus being on the shore of your life and maybe you still have questions. That's okay. But to get to the answer, you've got to get out of the boat. Come to Jesus who will reveal his plans and his purposes for your life. Come to Jesus who can heal your brokenness. Come to Jesus who can set you free. And it starts with a prayer where you say, Jesus, I'm following you. For the first time, for the tenth time, for the hundredth time, Jesus, I'm following. You release me to be all you've created me to be. I give you my pain. I give you my hurts. I give you my questions. I give you my confusion. I give you my failures. Would you give me your spirit so that I can discover your plans for my life? The band are going to play quietly because I want to give us an all an opportunity to, to meet with Jesus this morning in our own personal way. Maybe you need this morning to recommit to following him, recommit to serving him, recommit to living a life that honors him. I'll tell you this, Jesus is far more concerned with your relationship with him than he is in your past, your hurts, your failures, but he won't force himself into your life. Jesus could have walked on the water and got into Peter's boat. But he chose not to. He chose to stay on the shore because it was Peter's job to get out of the boat. You've got to swim to shore. You've got to leave that boat behind. And I want to give you space to do that. So God, we choose again to follow you. We pray that you would revive us, that you would restore us, that you would rebuild us, that you would recommission us, that you would re reposition us, regardless of where we are, regardless of where we've been, regardless of how we feel about ourselves. This morning we choose to put on our coat, dive in, and follow you. So just where you are, the band are going to play. I want you to take some time to pray. Maybe you want to turn to the person next to you and ask them to pray for you. Don't rush off. I know I've said put on your coats, but leave your coats off for a minute. Because I want you to hold this moment where we take these, these next couple of minutes. Where, you know, we said last week, Jesus is our Savior, but is he our Lord? He might be king, but have we crowned him yet? And I want to take, allow you to take this moment to just put God first again, to crown him, to declare he's enough, to make him Lord again, and to go all in. Just where you are, you can do this personally, you can turn to the person next to you, just pray that. Commit to diving in.